Hi, welcome to WetPixel Live. My name is Adam Hanlon. I'm the editor of WetPixel. And I'd like to thank Naughty Cam for sponsoring this episode. Naughty Cam have a wide range of housings um, and accessories and water contact optics. Um, please head on over to www.nauticam.com and have a look at um, all the stuff they do. Um, and I'd like to welcome Alex Mustard. Hi, Alex. Morning, Adam. Good morning. Um, and I'm going to throw Alex one of the big questions, or a big question. I'm going to say, what is ISO, Alex, and how do you use it? <laughs> um, I'm happy with the second part of that question. I'm not actually 100% sure I know what ISO stands for. I obviously know what it is, but I, um, I think it's something like the International Standardization Organization, yeah, which has got least, nothing yeah. to do with, with photography. No. Um, ISO is a measure of the, the, the game, the sensitivity of your camera to light. And it's one of the three things that we use to control exposure. We use aperture, we use shutter speed, and we use ISO. Yep. And I think it's really come into its own in the age of digital photography, because in the old days when you loaded film into your camera, it had a set ISO, or in those days often it was referred to as ASA, which I think was yep. the American Standards Association or something yeah, probably, of America. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. American Standards, uh, and anyway. Um, and um, but they were they were the same. And, you know, you uh, in film days, you were used to using 25 or 64, or 100 or 200 or 400. And ISO on digital cameras became really interesting because we we're able to change that ISO on the fly, picture to picture. And then it became particularly interesting, I guess, over the last 10 years when the cameras started to become really good at higher ISOs. And you got to a point where actually each camera came with a really a range of ISOs that yep. you could use with almost no significant penalty to image quality. Yep. And that really meant that it really became part of what you could use as a photographer in your photography all the time. And that's when it really became this third leg of the exposure tripod. In the old days, of course, it affected exposure, but we were generally always wanting to use the lowest ISO we could. Like um, these days, the cameras you know, really have that flexibility. And I think that's one of the big changes of digital photography. I think that's a really important point. I think I think many people coming from a film background, particularly where you know you the film that you put into the camera determined your ISO performance. And mm. by definition, there was always a trade-off. You could have a more light sensitive film, but that resulted in more grain. Um, and mm. you 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 had there was no that was that was the equation. That's the way it was. Mm. Um, and really, as uh, when we move to digital photography, which obviously we've moved quite a long time now, but it's important to almost take that mindset and throw it away and say, well, actually. You know, ISO is now an integral part of our exposure triangle, as opposed to something that we only use. We have to, you know, it's it's, it's one of the tools mm -hmm. that we have to expose our images correctly. And yeah, I and I think it's not point. just a film digital thing. I think it's a early digital, yep. modern yep. digital in that, yep. you know, you read early books on digital photography and they're like, well, you know, try to work at the lowest ISO. This camera's junk above this ISO, you know, yep. et cetera, et cetera. And so it's, you know, it's only really in the last, I guess, eight or nine years you know, yeah. that people have really had cameras that give that flexibility. And, you know, originally it came in on the, the bigger sensor cameras. And yeah. now it's really every camera has this ability to shoot over a much wider range of ISO. So the downsides of increasing your ISO in your photography is that, you know, it does create a bigger amount of, of I guess, signal to noise ratio in that the, the issues you see at higher ISOs when shooting with cameras is you get more noise in the picture. Yep. Both the grainy noise in the in the picture and color noise, where the camera's just not getting enough light to really get a good digital signal off the sensor, yep. and also you tend to see a dip in dynamic range. So yep. the amount of detail in the shadows, the amount of detail the camera can hold in the highlights, also tends to go down at higher ISO. But with each generation of camera, how high those problems start to come in gets higher and higher. And it has to be said that if you shoot very good pictures. Um, technically good pictures at higher ISO, and they don't need lots of fiddling about with in post, you can get away with incredibly high ISOs these days. Yep. I, I think the mistake that I see a lot in people, though, is that they do sort of think that the only issue of high ISO is noise. And people always say, oh, I've got any no noise at all when I shoot at ISO 3000 or whatever. And it's like, yes, but look at the highlights on that rock. That yep. rock was gray, and then suddenly the top half is white. There's no detail in that. And that's the loss of the dynamic range.
and there is also a trade-off here somewhat as well in that if we go back to the mechanics of the way sensors are designed the bigger mm. the actual sensors the, the 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 individual sensors are on on the sensor plate the better they deal with these issues and, and a really good example of this is is the sony a7s3 which is relatively recent um we have a friend in Mexico, uh, Natalie Gibb, who has a, one of these that she's using, shooting in the cenotes, um, and she's shooting at ISOs of 12,000, um, you know, massive, these massive ISOs. And that particular camera is a 12 megapixel camera, and it's designed specifically with these big photo sites that allow it to, to cope with very high ISO levels. It would always cope better than a high resolution camera. So, so we've almost got this constant balancing act in terms of camera design. You know, we want as much resolution as possible, but then we also want high ISO performance. And those are almost counteracting each other. So, so we need to be aware of that as well. Um, I have to say though that the camera manufacturers have been working wonders in yeah. recent years, and many of them find a, a really very good balance. And what I would say is that nearly all the interchangeable lens cameras that you can buy, you know, across the three formats, and whether they're SLR or mirrorless, all the cameras that are now really available are produce excellent image quality from their base ISOs at least up to ISO 800, and many yeah, of them much higher. And you can use those ISOs yep. without any real significant loss in image quality. Yep. Now, if you have the opportunity to shoot at the lower ISOs, you probably still should do to get the maximum quality out. However, as an underwater photographer, there may be other considerations. And I think particularly for those who are shooting on, on the bigger format cameras, when they shoot wide angle, there's a real need to keep that aperture closed. Yep. Um, to get really good corner sharpness in your wide angle pictures. And it's well worth shooting at medium to higher ISOs to make that more possible. Yep. Um, you know, trying to shoot an ISO 50 wide angle shot at F13 or F14 is quite tough. It requires a lot of strobe power. Yep. Whereas if you can do that at ISO 400 or ISO 640, it requires much, much less strobe power. And so, so that's where ISO really can come in handy. Again, for us. just to backtrack a little bit. So the corner Sorry. sharpness, remember, is a function of aperture and dome ports, effectively. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the smaller your aperture, the sharper your corners will be with the dome port. And it's particularly exaggerated with full frame cameras. So, so the technique that Alex is talking about here is basically rather than um, using a bigger aperture, we push ISO and that allows us to maintain corner sharpness and still get enough light effectively to get the, the, the image exposed correctly. Mm. And this is, I think this is, you know, certainly when, when we were chasing ISO more, given that most cameras now are pretty good at it, um, but when we, this was what really made a huge difference. You know, a couple mm. of stops of extra ISO performance was a big deal. Um, yeah, for sure. Mm. sure. I, I would say though as an underwater photographer, because I'm shooting most of the time with flash, and yep. I accept that cenotes are a very extreme example where you typically aren't using flash yep. and you're dealing with a very dark environment or you're dealing with flash guns a long way from the camera. And again, very dark environment. Most of the time in underwater photography, there aren't really needs for ISOs higher than, say, about a thousand, maybe sixteen hundred. And yep. the majority of the vast majority of my pictures are taken in, wide angle pictures are taken in the range of 200 to, to I would say, 640. Sure. Um, and it's only in those extreme examples. Extreme examples might be dark caves and caverns, maybe inside dark wrecks where you're wanting to work with available light or when you're diving deep. And those are situations when the higher ISOs come in. Sure. Um, the majority of the time, though, um, in underwater photography, we don't have that need to use those higher ISOs because we're dealing with a foreground subject that we're lighting with flash and we have plenty of light. But being able to get up to those sort of into the hundreds makes all that a lot easier. And I, um, think, I think it's worth, sorry. The, the other thing about high ISO performance, so obviously you mentioned at the beginning, Alex, and this is true, you know, you are going to sacrifice some dynamic range. But you know, if you are in a dark environment, the hold of a wreck, a cavern or a cenote, something like that, um, pushing ISO, there is stuff you can do to deal with noise in post as well. Um, you know, there are things like topaz denoise. It's slow, but it's very effective at dealing with um, with even really serious noise. Um, now, you are going to pay a price in terms of image quality. There's no doubt about it. I mean, so, yeah, um, that you are going to pay a, pay a price in terms of in terms of image quality, but you will still have an image. Whereas if you don't push the ISO, you simply won't you won't get that image. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I also use ISO in my macro shooting. And I use it to allow me to make very quick changes when um, when wanting to play around with depth of field and aperture. 
Yeah. Um, what are, you know, because all the exposure, the the, th the triangle of exposure, the tripod of exposure of shutter speed, aperture and ISO on your camera, one click of one is equal to one click of another. Yeah. So if I want to say I'm shooting a picture at, at F11, yeah. I will um, and I want to maybe go to F8, which is three clicks on my camera. Yeah. I will do three clicks of aperture and I will do three clicks of ISO. Yep. so that my exposure for my flash guns remains the same. And that's much quicker than reaching out and changing my flash gun. So I can have, you know, really interesting lighting that TTL would never be able to manage. And yep. then I can very quickly change my, you know, my aperture and at the same time actually change, you know, keep the exposure consistent by changing the ISO. So I'll, you know, and because we've got good image quality, you know, through such a wide range on our cameras these days, it allows us to make those changes. Now I'm not talking about going to really extreme ISO high values, but generally yep. when I'm shooting macro, I'll shoot around ISO 100, but I'll happily drop down to the, you know, even the, the low values of um, ISO 40 or, or even 25 on the, the D850, which is low, the lowest one uh, on low three, um, and I'll go up to ISO 400. And that gives me a lot of flexibility to make quick changes on aperture. Yep. Now, maybe if the subject is hanging around, I might then having, say, done some very wide aperture shots, at very low ISO, I might decide actually I'll you know I'll, I'll tweak the settings around a bit. But I, I find that's very usable use of aperture as of ISO as well is using it to allow you to make quick changes when shooting. Yeah, and certainly certainly I mean I think um, low ISO performance with macro. I mean I, I particularly like shooting quite shallow depth field images um, and shooting macro um, mm -hmm. in order to to remove backgrounds. Um, and certainly at that point you know coming down in ISO is a really is a really useful things to be able to do so uh, and we have the great advantage of modern cameras that we can we have got this range of you know potentially from 25 through to 1600 or whatever that's usable um, and, and this gives us this great flexibility and allows us to vary our apertures and, and shutter speeds as appropriate according to the type of shooting we're doing yeah yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, the, the other interesting use of, of ISO um, that I use underwater is when shooting available light subjects, you know, particularly, you know, um, dolphins or whales or whale sharks. Yeah. And in that situation, you know, you're dealing with an available light scene and the camera generally does a good job of automatically exposing that. Yeah. However, the action is often fast. And it can often be very variable as you're shooting up and then down and around and spinning around. There's a lot of difference underwater from shooting like that to shooting like this. Yeah. And I like to use auto auto ISO in that situation. Um, I don't use auto ISO, obviously, when I'm shooting with flash, because if the camera is changing the ISO all the time, so your flash exposure is being changed um, yeah. for you. But in those available light situations, it's a great way to shoot. So you can therefore dial in the shutter speed you want. Yep. Dial in the aperture you want, so you've got the corner sharpness that you think is appropriate. You've got the shutter speed that you think is appropriate to stop the movement of these often fast-moving available light subjects. And then you put the camera in auto ISO, and yep. the camera is basically then just varying the ISO to give you the correct exposure. Yep. And I know a lot of topside wildlife photographers use this technique the whole time to shoot yep. um, because it allows them to know they've got the right shutter speed for their long lens, yep. the right aperture, which is usually quite an open one to get their shallow depth of field. And then they can just let the camera vary the ISO. Now you need to keep a little eye on it because what you don't want to do is be end up shooting at ridiculously the wrong ISO. Yep. Um, but as long as, you've, you know, as long as you know, okay, the horizontal shot, um, that's fine. You can then let the ISO compensate for that up and down shot, and you can end up in a in a very nice position um, when shooting. Certainly with Nikon Auto ISO, and I'm I'm sure it's the same with other brands, uh, but um, we can actually set a limit on it as well. So so you can set that you will allow it to, uh, or a range, sorry, because it's a range from low to high. So so you can say okay, you can Auto ISO between 50 and 1600, um, and if it goes beyond that, it'll stop. Um, it'll stop adjusting ISO. So effectively, then the image will overexpose. But that would be, you know, that's so. So you can limit that, the range of auto yeah, ISO as well. I don't think that's as helpful in, as an underwater photographer as actually just making sure you're in a nice middle value when shooting horizontally at the beginning. Yeah. Because what you don't want to do is end up getting brilliant shots, and because you said limit, you're much. You know, so I, I don't think trusting the limiting system is as good as yeah. actually making sure that when you your first shot you've actually got a pretty decent mid-range ISO from where you want it to be with your horizontal. That means when it goes up, you'll be at a lower ISO. When you shoot down, it's higher. If a cloud comes over, 
it, yeah. it, again, it's going to stay in a reasonable place. So that would mean, obviously, when you're in the horizontal, you'll set up your manual exposure to expose correctly at that position with a reasonable ISO level mm -hmm. and then go from there. Yeah. 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 So if I was going to shoot dolphins, I'd probably set my shutter speed because they're very fast moving often yeah. at at least 320th, if not 1 500th. Yeah. I would probably set my aperture maybe f8, f11. Yeah. Um, you always need to sacrifice a bit of corner sharpness in that situation. Yep. Um, and, and then I was, and, and then I would jump in the water and check that my auto ISO is probably around 640, something like that when yep. shooting horizontally at those settings on a bright sunny day. Yep. And that gives me a good working place for that horizontal shot. Yep. I'll also take some test shots of the water or even my fin or maybe my buddy or something and check the exposure is right. And then I'll use the EV, the exposure um, um, compensation, yeah. just to make sure that that blue is correct on the auto exposure. And usually you want somewhere between um, three quarters of a stop and up to one and a third of a stop of underexposure to hold a nice blue with a camera because your camera is looking at that blue and trying to make it 18% gray. Yes, so it doesn't yeah. know it's supposed to be grew. And an 18% gray, which is a, a light gray, it's kind yeah. of, I guess, a bit, it's lighter than this. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I'm going the other way around. Um, it's um, think think aluminium cylinder, unpainted yeah. aluminium cylinder. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's trying to make the water look bright and light like that, and it tends to overexpose. So typically, whenever you're shooting in auto mode underwater, like auto ISO, you want to dial in uh, up uh, somewhere around a stop of underexposure. I tend to find with the modern cameras they do a better job, and it's actually two thirds of a stop or 0 0.7 underexposure is about right and using a, a, a whole frame metering system. And um, if it's an older camera, they often need a little bit more underexposure yep. um, to yep. get a good exposure for that. Yeah, so it's very useful. So I, I think the takeaway message really with ISO is, is you know, it's one of the tools at our disposal and, and you know, we shouldn't be scared of using it. Um, mm. And you know, and you know, get the images using using whatever method you need to, 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 to achieve using ISO. Mm. I think that's a reasonable uh, uh, paraphrase. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that advice is something that has changed mm -hmm. from what you and I would be saying 10 years ago or 12, Absolutely. 15 years ago. Yep. And yep. I think that's something to be aware of, that you could read a fantastic book on photography that maybe is is from that generation, and, and it will give you the wrong advice in this area because the technology has changed. Yep, 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 yep. And will undoubtedly change again in the future. So, yeah, yeah, yep. fantastic. Um, thank you very much, Alex. Um, Alex deals with ISO in his book. You got a copy handy there, Alex? I have, yeah, it's here. There you go. There you go. It's the so, one with the sticker on the front. It's the one with the sticker. It's a, a well-exhibited copy. Um, so um, yeah. have a look in there. Um, but again, you know, as Alex mentioned, you know, th this is obviously a subject that will be changing as technology changes. So so it's a good place to stay up to date with with um, with the changes. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, Thank you very much again to Nauticam for sponsoring this episode. We really appreciate their, their support. Um, thank you all very much for watching. Please add um, comments about ISO performance um, in the comment section and drop a like if you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you next time.